This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, how many people do know what TurboGeos is or ever used it in the past or things like that? None? Perfect, that's the best game. <laughs> Okay, TurboGeos is actually a very old web framework. It's as old as Django. They got started at the same time, uh, same year, like two months difference or something like that. And has been one of the most used web framework at, in the early 2000, together with Django. They were the two most used. Then, sadly, the TurboGeos team decided to write version two of the framework, which was a totally from scratch revive that was totally not compatible with version one, and so the community greatly shrinked. But it continues, continued to evolve, and it's now a really great framework. I started being part of the team in 2010, or around that time, and I always love working with TurboGeos because it's an incredibly fascinating framework with some great choices we are going to see. So I'm going to introduce you somehow the philosophy of the framework, then we are going to start a little uh, demo project for it. So we are going to see how TurboGeos is different from the other frameworks that you can see around and why it scales with you. And we are going to see an actual project with TurboGeos if I have enough time to show you. Okay. The major philosophy of TurboGeos can probably be uh, simplified in backlinks included, but feel free to remove them. It means that like Django, it comes with pretty much everything you might need for software develop for web development, but it's not built in into the framework. It's pre-configured. So if you want to remove a part of the system or change a layer with something totally different, you just, just need to comment that line that configures it for you in the project and replace it with whatever you want. So the, the uh, choice of the framework is to have pre-configured tools and pluggable applications and not enforcement. So nothing you are, we are going to see is actually enforced. You can replace any component of the framework. And there are people that work with TurboGeos, for example, with uh, template engines that are totally different from the standard one or things like that. But the main focus of the framework is surely on providing standards to the TurboGeos developers. So one of the most important parts whenever we change or add the new part of the framework itself is uh, making sure that every TurboGeos developer can feel at home when moving from one project to another one. What does it mean? It means that uh, if I start working on project one and I suddenly have to work on project two, I still should find the same exact uh, setups and things that I at home with and I used to. Even to the two projects might do totally different things. How this is achieved? Through various choices that the framework did. One of them is the dispatch system itself, which is particular if you ever work with any other web framework like Flask or Pyramid or whatever. They usually dispatch the request through the through regular expressions. So you map a regular expression to a specific controller view action, call it whatever your framework calls it. And that function or view get executed whenever the regular expression matches. And the output of that function is what you display to your user. So in TurboGeos, this is little difference. And everything starts from a controller, which is named the root controller, and goes on through that controller. So whenever you ask for a page, the path of the page, for example, index, matches with the method with the action of that controller that will get called and executed. For example, if I have a user's list, okay, which is not really RESTful, so <laughs> we are probably not going to implement it, but suppose you have a path which is users dash list, you are pretty sure that that path will be implemented in a user's controller at the method, method list. So whenever you see an URL, you are quick to find where that, the code that provides that URL is implemented. For example, if I have a my page URL, it is going to be the my page method inside the root controller. 
So you have no setup for routing. You, have, you don't need to declare regular expressions. You don't need to look at the regular expression and resolve them if you want to know where, where some code is implemented, which is at the beginning doesn't sound like a huge thing. It might sound actually a problem limiting or things like that. But when the project starts getting really big, you know there is a lot of pain in having to go through a file that has like 50, 60 regular expressions that you have to resolve for yourself and think, hey, okay, I wrote this URL, it's probably going to go there and things like that. Well, in this case, I just see the URL and know that, oh, it's there, go there. But if you want to provide some med totally custom routing with complex expressions and things like that, you can still go to extensions that are DGX routes or things like that, that provide you, for example, uh, the capacity to attach a custom route to a regular expression to a controller a method. Okay, so you have object dispatch by default, but as I told you, everything well part of the framework can be easily switched to something different. So you have object dispatch, but you can easily switch to a regular expression routing or whatever you want. There are other routing systems. And the world set path the, the whole set of things that are provided for you by the frameworks are actually provided for you by the quick start command. Tubekios comes with a, a common toolkit, which is Gearbox. And whenever you, for example, run Gearbox quick start, you create a new project, and that new project will have all the defaults that Tubekios provides set up for you. But if you want to go for something different and set up the projects yourself, like you like making single file applications like you usually do with Flask or Bottle or MicroFrameworks, you can use TurboGears in MicroFramework mode and just set the application up yourself. This is a fully working Turbo application that we sell the Hello World on the index page of your application. Okay, it just five lines of code, declare that you have the application and that the application will have this class has the root controller. This class has just one action, one method, which is index, which will of course have the index page. And then we just serve the application. So you see that the, there is a lot of magic involved in quick start, but underlying there is just a very simple framework that starts everything, resolving all the roots from what it is called the root controller. One more part that the framework tries to provide to you is uh, making sure that what you write is actually correct as far as possible. So there are a lot of uh, problems that the framework tries to catch for you. Like if you have in, invalid HTML, the template engine that comes with TurboGears, which is, uh, currently is Kajiki, which is a template engine that got developed in the context of the TurboGears project is fully validated. It means that, for example, if I mismatch a tag, like you see that here I open a list item, and here I close a span, which is, of course, wrong, because they are not, it's not the right tag. The template engine is going to tell me, you mismatch a tag, and it's going to tell me exactly where I mismatch it. And this happens at compile time, when you start your application, not when the user goes to the page and sees that everything is broken. If you ever work with Jinja or Mako or other template engine, you probably face the case where you render a huge page made of little components and then for some reason the layout is broken just because in one of the tens of templates that you declare there is a tag that is not properly closed and you take like four hours just to find that tag and fix it. Like in, with TurboGears and Kajiki, you just get it instantly. Your template is broken here go and fix it. But if you don't want to use Kajiki because, for example, you don't like the syntax or whatever, as Kajiki is fully validated, all the control flow is an attribute of the item. You can see that in this case we are looping over the fruit in fruits, and this, is, this loop is declared as an attribute of the list item. If you prefer more uh, uh, generic template engines like Mac or Jinja, you can just quick start with a different engine. Everything should work for you the same. You just won't be able to use like pluggable application that relies on Kajiki because if the other guy wrote his application for Kajiki and didn't provide a template, and a template for your engine, 
you cannot do much about writing that template yourself. One more thing that Kajik and Drupal Gears provide for you is internalization out of the box. Everything you write inside your template is already internationalized. So for example here that I wrote, I like fruit, this will be already translated if a translation is provided. No need to put get text calls around your code. Turbo Gears is smart enough to recognize the text part of your template and extract it whenever you collect the, thing, the strings that need to be translated. So I have a command python slapy extract messages which extracts all the strings that need to be translated for my templates and my controllers. And then if I provide the translation from them, so if <coughs> I translate the text itself, when I render the page, the framework will already serve the page in the proper language. So we are going to see that, for example, if I, when I do the demo application, if I set up the application, and there are parts of the framework like validation and widgets and things like that that are already translated for you, the admin, for example. If I have my system in Italian, it will be in Italian. If I have my system in English, it will be in English, and it will be already translated automatically. But if you don't want to go for the automatic translation, maybe because it's not ma smart enough to understand what you are trying to do, and you don't like the output, or whatever reason, usually, like in more than 100 projects that I did with Turbo Gears, I never needed to go and manually perform the translation. It always worked pretty fine. But if you want, you can go and do that manually and just call get text yourself inside your template, like you do with any other template engine, usually. And as it provides everything for you, it also, it also provides models by default. Turbo Gears uses SQL Alchemy for models. It actually uses SQL Alchemy configured in a few particular ways. It provides a declarative interface of SQL Alchemy. It provides a transaction manager. What does it mean? It means that if your request fails, there is a bug or a crash or whatever, Turbo Gears will automatically roll back the changes you did to the database for you. If your request succeeds, Turbo Gears will automatically commit them to the database for you. So if you have a crash, you don't have half written data on your database, which is one of the things that I noticed that uh, newcomers to Django always feel most complex because Django doesn't provide transaction out of the box. You have to manually do that yourself. And so people say, hey, I have I've written data because I, it crashed middle of the controller and it just wrote only part of the data and things like that. Why Turbo Gears made the choice to provide the transaction manager by default? If you want, you can disable it. Or if you are a MongoDB fan, you can even quick start the project with MongoDB instead of SQL Alchemy. And everything will work the same. The admin will work the same. Everything that Turbo Gears does for you on top of the models will continue to work, but we won't get to be. And if you have a complex uh, deployment, we may be master slave configuration of your database and things like that. Tubergeos supports out of the box that configuration. You can declare a master database and slave database, and it will automatically do load balancing of the queries. What does it mean? It means that the framework will automatically recognize read queries from write queries, and we'll send the read queries to the slaves and the only the writes to the master. And we'll do that automatically for you with just one single configuration option that you need to change. So if I should try to list all the uh, philosophy that the world philosophy that Turbo Gears provides, I can say that this is the list of the things that Turbo Gears decided to provide for you out of the box. So you have authentication and authorization. Whenever you have a project, you already have them set up for you, users, groups, and permissions. And you have scaffolds for models, controllers, and page. I don't know how many of you have ever worked with scaffolds. They are like quickie cutters for small pieces of your code. Like, I want a new controller. Gearbox scaffold controller. And it will create the code for a new controller, and then you modify it. I need a new model, Gearbox scaffold model. It will create a new model and you just need to modify it however you need it. And we automatically set up for you an admin to edit the models you have in your code. It will provide for you caching and session, the transaction manager, as I told you, immigration environment. So, uh, for example, 
uh, whenever you quick start a project, migration will come built in into the project and you can create new ones or things like that. But everything that is required to have database migration is built in into the project you quick started. And it will also provide the test suite for you. So whenever you have a new project, we, you get a test suite with like five or six tests that are pretty standard, like I can log in, I can log out, and things like that. And then you can just add more tests. This is really convenient because one of the most, not very really complex, but boring parts of writing a test suite is providing the fixtures, so setting up everything so that you can start writing your test. And that complexity is resolved for you by TurboGears itself. So you just need to write the test and you know that you have a user available, a, a group for that user, the database is properly set up, and whatever you might need to do. You get internet synchronization, and you get, of course, an interactive debugger. So if you have a crash in your code, you can go and debug it. And you also get controllers profiling and query profiling in the pages. So when you are looking at the page, you can see where your code was low and w which queries were low. Now, what's the state of TurboGears today? Today, we are at release 2.3, 2.3.10, if I'm correct. And that means that the last major release is 2.3. This might be confusing. TurboGears is TurboGears 2, so the 2 is always there. The major release is actually the, the next one, so this is release 3 of TurboGears 2. And the dependency got recently reduced from 40 dependency to just 4. This was one of the major changes in version 2.3. Previously, it was pretty hard to install TurboGears. It involved a lot of other dependencies and um, um, libraries. Now it just needs four. This is because it got introduced in micro framework mode. So you can now use TurboGears like you would use Flask or Bottle. Previously, you can only use TurboGears in a jungle way, I would say. And it supports all the major Python versions, and version 2.3 got three times faster than the previous version. So it's not a little, 300% faster. And we are going to release 2.3.11 this year, and then there will be 2.4, which involves a new configuration system, much more flexible. I don't know if you ever worked with Pyramid, which is pretty flexible in setting up your configuration. The configuration system of TurboGear, so you switch to something similar, which is pre-configured for you, but will allow to uh, inject new parts of the framework at runtime and things like that. So this is, for example, the dependencies that got reduced. This is updated to 2.3.6, but shouldn't have changed. These were the dependencies in 2.2, and these are the dependencies in 2.3. So it got far faster and easier to install the framework. And this is the uh, benchmark of a Hello World application running on past or single threaded. So don't look at the numbers, it's just to show you that the same exact application in the same exact system, in the same exact configuration, which is the one you should not be using because it's a single threaded and whatever. <laughs> There's a lot of limitation, but it's the one you get out of the box to, for development on your system. It's like three times faster than the version 2.1 and 2.2 and things like that. So, okay, now I don't have a lot of time left, like 40 minutes should be enough to show you something. I would like to actually get started at the TurboGears project and show you how it works. Okay, first thing I'm going to create a, um, a virtual environment where I'm going to install everything. I'm going to run my code with Python 2.7 because it's the one that I get by default on my system, but everything that I'm going to show you works on Python 3.2. I tested all the, the wall example before on Python 3, so I'm sure it does. <laughs> so let's create a virtual environment. And inside that virtual environment, I'm going to install a package which is named tg.devtools. Uh, there are two packages you can use to install TurboGears. One each is TurboGears 2, which installs the framework itself. And this one you can see the install, not much. It's like installing Flask. You just get the framework, not much else. But to actually start working with a big project and things like that, you probably want to install something which is called tg.devtools. 
which provides you with the world development tools you might need to work with Turbo Gears. Like for example, it provides the Gearbox command, which is not provided out of the box. Well, I didn't provide him any command, so he told me that he didn't know what I'm saying. Uh, while if I install only the framework, Gearbox, for example, is not provided. If you have a look at the documentation, it already states this for you, so you don't have to remember everything I said. You can easily go to the Turbo Gears web page and documentation, and Turbo Gears documentation. And there are tutorials, there are at least three. One that gets started with the micro framework mode, one that gets started with a full stack application, and one that does the same application, the same full stack application, but only using the Turbo Gears admin, so you won't write the, the forms yourself and things like that. You will rely on the admin for everything. And then there is documentation on single parts of the code and whatever you might need. And there is also, once you understood everything of Turbo Gears, there is also a convenient cheat sheet, which is, well, ah, because the domain is not there anymore. I need to update the URL, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, okay, let's go back at the example. Now, I, now that I installed everything, I can uh, quick start the project itself which I'm just going to call it plain. So this command will create a new Turbo Gears project for me so that I don't have to set up anything. And okay, the project is there, got created. This is pretty much like cookie cutter if you ever use it. It provides a new project for me and this is my project. Now I'm going to install the project. As I told you, everything is pre-configured by you, uh, for you by quick start. So it means that also it pre-configures the dependencies of your project. So I'm now going to install my project so that all the dependencies that the project needs are going to get downloaded and installed. This is because, for example, if I decided to start a project with Jinja instead of Kajiki or with MongoDB instead of SQL Alchemy, they need different dependencies. So they couldn't come with the framework. They are dependencies of your own project. So you can see that in this case it installed, for example, Kajiki, uh, because I started it with the default options, and it installed SQL Alchemy, because I started it with the default option. If I started a project on a different engine and different uh, database, I would get different dependencies, of course. So let's see what I got from my built-in project. I go to Gearbox 2, and now instead of Using quick start, I'm going to do serve, which means serve my web application, okay? And this starts a simple web server for you, you can use to deploy on your own machine without paying the cost of setting up Apache or whatever you want to use to use your application. And then if I go there, I get my application. Okay, this is an example application you got by quick starting. It tries to provide you an overview of what you got. For example, if I go in about section, you see that it tries to explain what there is inside your application and the URLs that it provided and things like that. I'm not really interested in this part. And the good part is that one of the things that it provided you is out of the box, the profiling. So the, this is the Turbo Gears debug bar. So for example, I can see here what happened inside my request. So here I know that the total time that it took to render this page is two milliseconds. And how did it spend these two milliseconds? It spent them like everything was in the root index, practically. So it's set up the framework and serve the index of the page. And out of these two milliseconds, like one and a half is involved in rendering the template because of course my temp controller is empty, it's not doing much. So all the complexity is in rendering the web page itself, the HTML. And I can easily see it from here. You can see out of these two milliseconds, one and a half is the render time of the template engine and 0.0, .0 is the time that Turbo Gears took to actually dispatch and serve your controller and things like that. Really interesting, so if I want to see if my controller ran any query, I can see that here it didn't. And I can see what, which controllers are available inside and what was my request and the usual things you might need for debugging. Okay, now that I know that my controller didn't run any query, let's go to a controller that does run some queries. <coughs> like the login, 
login, of course, has to look up the user and things like that. But if I do this now, I get an exception. Why do I get an exception? Because the reason is because I wanted to show you the interactive debugger, but the real reason is because I have no database at all currently. I didn't set up the data in my database. So, of course, it did complain that there is no such table user. Okay. Let's see if uh, this is the debugger that comes with Turbo Gears. And, for example, I can go inside the context and see uh, the exact line of code where it, this happened. This is, of course, not my code, so it's not really helpful to see. Let's go here in authenticate. This is inside the code of the application. And here it makes more sense. Okay, it's time to authenticate the user, but it couldn't perform the query, of course. And for example, I can even see what, what was trying to do. Like if I go here and say print identity, uh, sorry, dump, I get here the details of what was available. And this is the identity that was trying to authenticate. No login and no password. So I know that I didn't provide a, a username and password, which is fine because I don't even have a database, so it doesn't make much sense. So let's start, let's create this database. So I stop my application. And now I run a different gearbox command, which is setup dash app which creates the database for me. OK, and it did like create the tables, and initialize the migrations, and create the users, and things like that that I have. This is not magic. It's all defined inside a, a, a module, which is um, plain dash web setup booster. OK, yes, I know. And this is everything that gets done when it has to set up your database. So it creates a user group and whatever. And you can change this part if you want to do something different. And now if I serve again my application, which now has a database configured, I should be able to authenticate. And I know that the default ones are manager, manage pass. OK, welcome back, manager. I got in. And now I can go to the admin and see all the users that are configured. And these are the users. And I can see the queries that got executed to fetch them. Okay, so I know that it selected the user, it selected the groups, the permissions, and tried to recover the count of the users. And I can even ask the toolbox to explain the query for me. So no, if it's using any index, why it's low, and things like that. In this case, it says that it's using an index which is on top of username. Or I can see the results that it fetched. And I see that this is the result that it retrieved that specific query. OK. Really interesting, but it's not something that I really care about. This is already done for me. And the admin provides the usual features like sorting, editing, and whatever you might need to do. And let's try to add something that created ourselves, not just look at the data that TurboGear set up for us. So what I'm trying to do is now set up something like, um, why well, it's not quitting? OK, it got. Like a blog post. So I'm going to create a model for my articles, where I'm going to store my articles on the database. So I'm going to say scaffold model article. Because this means I want to create a new model for an article. And Gearbox created it for me, so I can see it's there. Let's open the project with PyCharm so I can edit it somehow. Did it start? It started. OK. OK, here is my model. And you see, by default, it provides a sample model with just data. It doesn't know what you're going to store there. One thing to, that I'm going to do is import this into the model init. This makes the model available to the admin. Only the models that you import here are <coughs> visible by the admin. It takes for granted that if you didn't import the model here, it means that you wa don't want to show it into the admin and things like that. So I'm going to say model.article import article. Voila. And I'm going to restart my code. This time with the reload option. So if I make changes, I don't have to manually restart it every single time. And let's go back to our models, and we see that article is here. But if I try to open it, it says, hey, 
I couldn't recover the data for articles. You don't even have a table for articles, of course. They say no such table articles. True. I started, I did set up the database before I created the models of all the articles. So how could my database know that the article existed? It couldn't. So the database that I have now has tables for everything, but not for the articles. So I need to set up the articles. And there are two things that I can do. One is use migrations, which is the thing you will do on production when you have a real project. You will create a migration that creates the articles table for you. But now, in this case, it's not a real project. We don't have any data that we want to preserve or things like that. So I can just run the setup app command again. It will try to recreate the database. It will fail on creating the users and things like that because they are already there. But it will succeed in creating the articles table. So let's stop the project and let's run setup app again, which if you remember, it does set up the database. So if I run it again, it says, hey, here you can see it. There was a problem adding your authentication data. It may already be added. Yeah, it's true. I already did have a user and things like that. But it also says, continuing with Booster. I know this might happen, so I'm going to bootstrap every other table. In this case, it bootstrapped my uh, articles table. So if I go back to the articles, I now see that that warning disappeared because I now have a table for the articles. If I want to add an article like your hey, sample data and assign it to the manager user, whatever, I can create it and you see that, of course, it's uh, visible in the list of the articles. Okay. Now, I have an article which only has data, and we know that articles has at least a title and a content, so I want to change my article. Uh, I'm not really interested in data, so I'm more interested in having title and content. So let's go back to the uh, pie chart, and let's replace these with two columns, which are the title and the content. So let's say title and server default. which is empty for everything that did already exist because it didn't have a title, but it's not nullable. It means that Tuberius will require you to insert a value for that one. And let's add the content, uh, uh, something. Okay. Now I change my model to have a title and the content, but on the database itself, is the table still only has data. So it won't work if I did it. OK, it, you notice that it uh, identified that I changed my model, so it reloaded the application by itself. So I don't need to restart it. If I go here, you see that it's now complaining that there are no such column title. OK, and you say, hey, in the database, you don't have that column. You declared it in the model, but not in the database which is true because my database doesn't know about that. So what I'm going to do now is something that won't work because SQLite doesn't support changing the schema of the database. And to avoid the cost of setting up MySQL, Postgres, or whatever, I'm currently running everything on SQLite, which doesn't support the wall SQL commands. <coughs> one of the commands that doesn't support completely is outer table, which is the one that you need to change the columns of a database. Well, I'm going to show you how it works. OK, so I'm going to create a migration. I'm going to say, I don't really care about what I have to change. Please find that for me. I'm not interesting. So auto-generate a migration. I'm going to tell it to call it article. And what TurboGeos is going to do is, oh, uh, gearbox migrate. Tuberkis is going to create a migration for me. It tells, hey, make sure you look at that migration, because I'm not magic, you know. I can't understand everything. I tried to do the best that I could. So let's go to the migration and see what Tuberkis decided to do. And it actually did the right thing. They say, hey, from in the articles table, add those two columns, which are the content and the title, and remove the data one which is good, because it's exactly what I needed. 
replace the data column with the title and content ones. But the problem is that if I try now to migrate, to run these migrations or to upgrade my database, it will fail because SQLite says, I don't understand this command, which is a perfectly valid command. The command is right. The problem is SQLite itself. So, but if you run on a real database like MySQL or Postgres, it will work for you. So what I'm going to do instead of running the migration, I'm going to delete the database, which is storing this file. I'm going to set it up again. And this time you will notice one more thing that the first time we did set up the database, it didn't do. You will see this line. It means that when I run setup up, it knows that it doesn't have to create the tables, it doesn't, it doesn't have to go through the world, all the migrations that you add because you already uh, declared the models and the model is already there, so the table is already going to be created by the setup app. There is no need to run the migration that is going to create that table. So it will already identify at which version it has to set your database at. So previously you saw that it did try to upgrade Okay, it did try to upgrade to this version, which involved changing my model. Now it, it understands that the model is already correct, and so it sets the database already at that version. So you won't, you won't have to upgrade, and even if you try, it shouldn't do nothing. Yeah, exactly. Say nothing to upgrade. Your database is already in the correct state. So let's run the application again, and this time if I go here, I see that there are the, the alert that previously I had is disappeared, and it's okay. Let's create a new one. Uh, yeah, of course, the, the, that file contains everything. The data, the columns, structure, the schema, everything. So if you delete that database, you lose everything. And as our setup app didn't provide any default article, it only gets reintroduced the default data, which involves the groups and the permissions, but no articles. Okay. I'm going to introduce one just to go on with my demo, okay? My article, my content, and whatever. Don't care about the user. Okay, and here I see that there is the article. Now, usually I don't want my users to look at the articles through the admin, so I want probably to provide an index page that shows those articles. So what I'm going to do is actually to show you a little feature that UberGears has, which is the so-called, oops, inventing mode. So whenever you are working on the graphic part of your application, you might want to turn on this feature because it will automatically update the look of your web page while you are changing it, which is very convenient when working on the front end part of your code. So now I'm going to open the template for the index and I'm going to remove everything apart from those two classes. Okay, and here set an H1 articles. Okay, this is my new web page. If I go here, I see that it's already updated with everything that I change. So it's really convenient if you work with your editor and your web browser near one to the near to the other because you can see what changed in real time while you are changing it. And if you don't like something, you just change it again and you see how it changed. But I'm pretty happy with the results, so I'm going to turn it off and go on making the changes. Now, it's not really that I'm happy with the result because it does nothing. But I'm going to go into the index. You know that I told you that everything is resolved by the name of the method and the name of the controller. So in this case, for example, I know that the index page is resolved by the root controller index method. Okay, so I can go here. And here I can look for the articles, which involves making a query to uh, the articles and just get all of them and then provide it to my template. Okay, 
let's turn again the inventing mode so I can see when they ap appear. Then I go here, and here I can say pi for article in articles and provide like an h3 article.title and <coughs> like a p for article.content and here it is and if I go back it appeared you saw that it appeared while I was switching things and this is exactly the article that I did in my admin and you can even see that if something has changed the article like here uh, it will update there it won't up update automatically of course because it only recognizes changes so uh, my new article title but the inventing mode should be able to recognize that the content change my new article in real time <laughs> so I can actually see what's changing this is because what TurboGears does underline is not looking at your code but it's looking at the result so it creates a hash of your web page and it reloads whenever that hash changes so it knows that something in the content of web page change it doesn't really care about what change so for example it will identify if you change your CSS your style whatever if the web page change it will reload it and okay, I'll show you the inventing mode so I can turn it off again. <laughs> okay, now what I want to do is probably allow my users to change those articles because I don't want everyone to go to the admin every single time it has to change an article. So let's see how we can introduce a controller that is involved in changing the articles. So I will go back to a scaffold for a controller and the controller for the articles so this will create an article controller okay and it did so I can go back into my code and I see that here I have a new controller which is article and I go to the index and now I'm going to add this controller to the root of the um, sorry of the website so here well, uh, yeah, of course I have to import it. This will complain, so let's import it from play.controls. Okay. Now if I go to the dash articles uh, URL, I should end up in the index of the articles. Uh, oh, sorry, I stopped the <coughs> server to make the change. It will tell me that there is no template for that web page, of course, because I didn't create one. So what I'm going to do is create a template for that page, which again involves scaffold, template, article. Voila, and now I have a, a sample page for that page. If I reload, it's there. And this says only it's an article and this is a template page for the article. Fine, thank you. Now I didn't really care about this part. What I wanted is provide a way for the user to edit an article. So I'm going to add a new action to this page, which is uh, the edit action. And I want to edit a specific article. And I don't care about anything else, just want an article ID. This means ignore any other parameter that the user might provide you. Just throw them there. And what I need to do is expose a page with a form that is going to be used to, be, to edit the article. So I'm going to create articles.templates.articleEdit. This is how I'm going to call my template. And let's create the template. This time I call it article edit, so I don't forget about it. And if I go into the templates, I see that now I have that page. Fine, so if I go to the articles, I now should have an edit URL, which will tell 404 because I didn't provide an article ID, and I provide an article ID and I go to the actual web page. 
which does nothing because I still didn't implement anything. So let's provide a, a, a form to edit this article. I only have like 10 minutes left, but I'm going to introduce one of the things that I like most of Turbogears. You might choose not to use them and do everything by hand, but Turbogears comes with a full widget, widget framework with layouting and things like that. So I'm going to use the widget framework to create the form. So I'm going to import, sorry, import the web of forms as the web and import the web of cars. The uh, widget framework is called Tosca Widget 2. That's why it's uh, TW2. And I'm going to declare my article for which is the web dot form. And I'm going to declare a layout for it, which is the web.widgets.basin layout. And what I'm going to put inside this layout is the article ID, which is something that the user shouldn't see. So I'm going to use a needem field. And the actual sorry, and the actual title, which is instead something that I want the user to uh, text field and the content. So these are the parts that I want the user to be able to edit. And then I'm going to say to the form that whenever the user submits the form, it has to, um, uh, to post the data somewhere. And this is done by saying action equals to, is it correct? Yeah, and it's not, I didn't really need this lazy URL call. It uh, just, I used to put it always because this will, if you are going to serve your application on a URL that is not the root of your domain, TurboGears will automatically adapt the, all the URLs for you. So I don't have to go and replace everyone if I just change where I'm deploying my application. But yeah, there is no need for it. You can just go and say, Article said it if you are sure that you are going to serve the application on the root of the domain. So this already did the declare the form. So I'm going to provide the form for to my template. And inside my template, I'm going to replace all these with form.display. We should actually display my form. Uh, no. What was it? Ah, because I didn't call display. <laughs> okay, here it is. It's not really good looking because I used the base layout. It's a terrible layout, but there is a reason why I did it. You can like use the table layout if I'm correct. Yeah, okay. It starting to improve still <laughs> looks very ugly. The reason why I use the base layout is because I want to provide a custom template to this widget. And there is a template that is provided by the TurboGears admin for us, which uses Bootstrap. So I can go and say, hey, use the um, uh, Bootstrap layout for uh, Bootstrap for should be named like this, I'm not sure. We are going to know it pretty soon. It wasn't named like that. So let's see how it was named. Yeah, sorry, back. Here it is. This one. Well, it was nearly correct. It was templates instead of template. Okay, here I see that it now starts to look better. I need some classes that I want to provide, like CSS class form control and CSS class form control. And well, the text area didn't get it. I'm not sure why. And I want to, ah, okay, because I provided it to the wrong component, sorry. 
Okay, and I want also to make my button look better. So I say submit is dwf.submit button and I say save CSS class. It can apply. Voila, it now looks like a <laughs> better form. Still far a lot for improvements, but at least it's there. So now, as I'm, go I'm, I'm actually editing an article, like I'm editing article one, I want to fill the form with the data that I have in article one, because it's something that I'm editing, it's not a new data. So here inside the edit, I'm going to fetch that article. Uh, I need to import the database, of course. I'm going to fetch that article. Okay. That's important. Okay, what I did here is uh, not really complex, but it's long, so I'm going to explain it. I wrote a query that looks <coughs> for the article with that ID, and if it doesn't find it, it will just abort with a 404, okay? <laughs> so this is really convenient as it uses the fact that Python evaluates the OR lazily, so it won't call the abort if the first part of the, uh, of the expression succeeded. And I'm going to provide that article to the form. Uh, actually, I'm not really interested in the article. I'm more interested in the article data, but well, let's go send everything. So here I'm going to say, I'm going to provide that data to the form, which was article ID equals article dot UID, uh, title equal article dot title, and content equal article dot content. This should work. Yeah, it did. So now I, as I'm editing the article one, I see that here I get the things that were contained in article one. If I try to edit an article that doesn't exist, I get a 404 properly because my query did or 404. So let's go back to our form and try to actually perform the edit. And it does nothing because I didn't I shall implement any place where it should submit the data. So I'm going to change the action to a save endpoint so that when I submit the form, I actually get the data saved. I uh, don't care. Oh, sorry, it was one. And now it, of course, says you don't have a save point, save endpoint. You didn't declare one. So I'm going to declare one. And this time I don't need a template because it's an endpoint that doesn't have to show anything to the user, just have to save the data. Uh, it's article ID and then the data. I'm going to say, do the same as before. So let's fetch the article that I'm trying to fetch, to edit, sorry. And let's actually edit it for uh, key that be in case. Set after article k.me. This is going just to set to the article everything of value that you provided to that URL. And then just return redirect to the list of the articles, so to the index page. And maybe say something to the user, so it's happy that it knows that article edited. So at least I get some feedback. I, just, I don't just see my page changing. So let's go back to articles, edit dash one, and try to change title, title, new title, and save it. And it worked. You say article edited and the title of the article actually changed. Okay, this is good, but for example, I might want to improve my framework in many ways. Like if I don't provide the title, I don't want to have an article without a title. So I want to make sure that the user is providing one. So I'm going to introduce what is called validation. And validation in Turbo Gears is provided by the validate decorator. And I just need to say validate against the form, so against the article form. And it, if it fails, 
just send the user back to the edit page because it provided wrong data. Is validate important? Yes, of course. And now it's not doing going to do much because my form doesn't didn't say anything about how it should be validated. So here for each field on my form, I'm going to provide a validator, which is the standard one, and say that it's required. And now let's try again. And you say, hey, please enter a value. And you see that it did this for us. And like many of these standard errors are already translated for you. So if I switch my computer to Italian, I will see a favor in solution valor. And so and everything works for all the fields for which I declare the uh, a validator, and then if I provide the proper value, it's properly my name. Okay, so I don't have much more time left, so I'm going to reserve the last minute for quick questions, and <laughs> I'm go going to go further. Okay. Yeah, I. If you go to the Turbo Gears web page in the documentation section, there are three tutorials which I suggest you run one after the others because they create more and more complex applications involving many things. So I suggest you get started with the really simple get started tutorial, which creates a single file application that serves hello world and nothing, not much else. But it makes really clear to you how TurboGIOS works, what are templates, what are controllers, how the things work, and things like that. Then I will switch to the full stack tutorial, which involves a complete application with a database, with the commands like Gearbox Quick Start, Gearbox Scaffold, all these commands that TurboGIOS provides for you. And then if you want to go for rapid prototyping, you want to have a look at this third tutorial, which explains how to create an application relying only on the Turbo Gears admin. So instead of declaring the, the widget, the form, myself, like I did, you can have the admin create the forms for you based on the models, instead of having yourself to say, hey, I have a title, I have a content. You can say, admin, please create a form for an article. And it will look at the article and create a form that provides a way to edit all the data of the article. Then once you are, uh, you understood the major parts, you might want to have a look at the parts that cover a specific part, like how dispatching words are templating, the whole template language, like all the commands that you have available, like by if, by switch, by for, by with, by ads, and whatever, how templates inheritance works in more complex application, uh, scaffolding, like, you want to create models, controllers, so you want to create your own scaffolds, and validation, alerts, widgets, access control and authorization, because TuberGuilds provides authorization and controls for you, built-in pagination, caching. Then, once you read all these, you should have a pretty complete view of every single feature that is available in TuberGuilds, and maybe you can go for the cookbook, which provides ready-made, Recipes for the most recipes for the most common things like deploy, caching, uh, background task, or things like that. And if there is something you may need, you can go to the reference and look at it, like auto pagination, and there is the paginate method and things like that. The, the documentation is huge, so something might be missing. If you find something that you don't know how to do, just drop an email in the uh, TurboGIOS mailing list which is uh, specified in the uh, web page itself and community. And if you write there, you will see that someone will respond pretty quickly. And I'm usually the one that is going to write a documentation web page for that part that you are missing because I really care about the documentation. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, every controller has a method you can call to know where it's mounted. So it's mount underscore URL. 
But I usually tend not to do that because it makes the code pretty complex and tangled because every controller that you want to know you need to import from there. And so you start having too many dependencies from the controller. What I try to do is more rely on relative URLs. So I'm, I don't care about where I exit in M. I know that my mid edit function is uh, one step before or things like that. So that whenever I switch controllers, as far as I switch a whole set of feature, a whole controller, it will continue to work. And even if I copy that controller to a different project, it will continue to work because the relative URLs are the same. Okay, any further questions? Okay, well, all right, I think it's about time for lunch now. And um, after lunch, lunch, we lunch, we start from this 1 p.m. to about 3 p.m. And after we'll come back for another talk here. So please don't forget to fill the feedback forms, okay? Right, thank you so much, Alexandro. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>